How's it going Eliminators? Today we're going to be starting a video series on a John Deere 325 riding lawnmower. My customer brought me this mower and there was oil leaking all over the engine. So the first thing I did was I power washed the engine and we tried to locate where exactly the oil was coming from. Now I did ask him a few questions to try to determine how much oil has been leaking out of this and he said that he only had to put oil in it every month or so so I know that it is a slow leak but we really couldn't determine where exactly the oil was coming from as there was just so much oil that had covered the entire engine over the years so after discussing it with him he ended up agreeing that the best course of action would be to get a complete engine gasket kit and this John Deere 325 uses a Kawasaki I believe it's a 540 V engine so with that being said let's get right into it So here it is in all its glory. You guys can see that the hood has clearly seen better days, but we're gonna have to remove that and I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. Now, first thing I'm gonna do is remove the hood. So if we come over here, there will be these little tabs and all you have to do is pull off a little spring clip on either side with a little bushing and your hood will pull right out. So now that the hood's off, it now exposes the Kawasaki engine underneath of it. The engine code is an FC540V dash FS 15 and that is a 17 horsepower Kawasaki engine made for John Deere and there's your model number just so you guys are aware so what we're gonna be changing is the crankshaft main seal underneath then we're gonna be changing the sump gasket we're gonna be doing the head gasket and we're gonna be doing the overhead valve gasket and any other gasket that they include in the kit but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's just it so the first thing I'm gonna do is fire this engine up and I'm gonna let it run for a few minutes let that oil warm up and it will be much easier to drain because I'm going to be draining the oil oil before I remove the engine. So it does run, idles great. So like I said, I'm gonna warm this oil up. We're gonna bring this into my shop and I'm gonna start the disassembly process. So I got her in my shop and the first thing I'm gonna be doing is coming down to the oil drain right there. I'm gonna open that up and I have just an oil pan there with a, an old oil filter sitting in it. So I'm gonna drain out the oil. Then I'll come over to the left side of the machine and pull the oil filter. And they have this nice little design with a plate here so that any oil that drips down just kind of comes out here. And it makes things a lot cleaner when you're working on it. I really like this design. So with the engine oil hot, it drains a lot easier. I could have pumped it out with my Pella oil extractor. If you haven't seen that video, click in the top right of your screen. This engine is going to be coming off anyway, so I want to drain as much out as possible without leaving a little bit in the bottom. And if you open your dipstick here, oil will come out a little faster. One thing I did not mention though, was that my customer also said the drive belt is going to have to be replaced eventually. So he asked when I do have the engine off, go ahead and take a look at the drive belt. If I think it needs to be replaced, go ahead and replace it. So what I did was when I was ordering all of these parts from Stens for this engine, I went ahead and ordered a Kevlar drive belt for this John Deere. As always guys, part numbers will be in the description down below so that I don't have to put them in the video itself. And basically if it needs to be replaced now, I'll go ahead and replace it. If it doesn't, then I can replace it later, but at least I'll have one in stock. Now, because this engine runs, I'm not going to be removing the air filter cover or the air filter itself because I wanna to try to limit the amount of stuff that can go into the air box and then down into the carburetor. So basically I'm gonna leave that on for now. And then once the engine's reinstalled, I can go ahead and install my air filter last. So while the rest of the oil is draining there, I'm just looking at the carburetor and the fuel line and I can see that it runs up to a fuel pump. So that means that I can disconnect that fuel line, drain whatever fuel is in the line from the carb to the pump. So once you get your fuel line clamp off, you should be able to pull off your fuel line and disconnect that. And then we're gonna go ahead and disconnect the wire that goes to your fuel shutoff solenoid. That's basically your anti-backfire that just puts a plunger up into the carburetor and that stops the flow of fuel through the main jet. Once you have that disconnected, I can see that there's also a cable going up here. This is most likely a oil pressure sensor. So I'm gonna undo that little bolt and we're gonna pull that off. Now, once you have those wires off, I'm just running back down the loom here. I can see that the only other wires are two ground wires connecting to this side. And that nut there is one of the engine mounts. So I can leave that for now, or I can just go ahead and loosen that off now and disconnect my wires either way. We can see that this cable running down here goes to our choke and throttle lever. So what I've done is I've put the choke on full and that puts it in the upright most position. Then what I'm gonna do is take a permanent marker and I'm just gonna mark it right on the cable itself. 
and then I can go ahead and disconnect this Phillips screw and unhook my cable. And all the permanent marker does is just give me an idea of where to hook up my cable when I'm reattaching everything. And anything that I'm removing that I can put back in and tighten up, then I am doing that. Whenever you're doing an engine removal, there's gonna be a lot of bolts. And if you're not careful organizing your bolts when you remove them, you can kind of get screwed up a little bit as to where a bolt should go. So this would be a great time to go ahead and get yourself a magnetic tray. A magnetic tray will just allow you to keep all of your bolts organized and you can use multiple different ones. If you want to use Ziploc bags, you can go ahead and do that. But basically right now I'm just going around and disconnecting everything that I should have to disconnect. And then we can go ahead and tackle the engine bolts. So because this engine runs, I've gone ahead and reconnected the fuel line up at the carburetor. And this engine has a fuel pump. Fuel pump is bolted to the engine. I don't want to have to remove stuff if I don't have to. So I'm going to come over here and remove the fuel line right at the fuel filter. We're going to be changing that anyways later. But what that allows me to do is just when I do disconnect the engine, I can just pull it up and I don't have to worry about disconnecting the fuel pump up here. Now would be a great time to come up to your battery and disconnect your battery terminals. The reason you're going to want to disconnect at least maybe your ground or your positive is so that when you do come down to your starter and you're disconnecting the battery positive from the solenoid itself, if you're loosening that that nut with a wrench and you touch the engine, the engine is ground, this is a positive, so you connect your circuit. So by disconnecting one of the terminals directly at your battery, you will prevent harming yourself or your engine. Now the battery positive terminal is seized in place, but I was able to get the negative loose, so I'm gonna remove that. Now these little alligator clips here, my customer said they were to run some kind of auxiliary, and if we follow the cables, it goes back through here along the body to this little box here, and we can see that Oh, there's just a couple loose wires in there, which really you don't want that guys. That's like super dangerous. 12 volts going in with, you know, metal parts here. That would have started to warm things up. There could have been a fire. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cap these lines separately. I don't want to completely remove it because my customer might need it. And I don't want to mess with it because everything works. So all I'm going to do is cap those lines. And I'm assuming those wires will eventually hook up to something like an accessory salt spreader, maybe for wintertime. Who knows? But these are just the things that I'm documenting in the process of tearing this down. And this I'm just going to leave off to the side. So I've now disconnected the battery positive as well as our positive that comes from our battery to power the solenoid. And then we're just going to unplug the little ground here. And once you have your starter solenoid disconnected, come over here to your red plug. We're going to be disconnecting that. And now we have the electrical side other than that ground on the other end. Uh, taken care of so I'm just going to come up here remove this and slide my cable back and then I'm going to tighten that back up same thing with this little nut here on the solenoid guys like I said I'm putting everything back onto the engine just so that I limit the amount of bolts that are in my tray now you guys can see that I haven't removed my oil filter yet and that's because I don't want to get oil all over me when I'm down removing the what I think are four engine bolts so I'm going to leave that on for now and then once I have the engine uh, loose and I don't have to go up underneath it anymore, then I can go ahead and remove that oil filter. Next up, I have a couple of jack stands just up underneath the frame here on these little mounts. And I'm just gonna slowly lower those into position and then I can reposition my jack stands if need be, center them up as best as possible. Make sure you do that on both sides because you never, and I wanna make this clear, never trust a hydraulic jack with your life, guys because the only thing that holds this is a little hydraulic seal in there. It could be an O-ring. And if that ever let go, if you're working on a car or riding lawnmower, whatever it is, that will come down and you could be up under that machine and you could get seriously hurt or even killed. So you can see the wheels are a little on an angle, but the mower is sitting level and that's what we want. Here comes the best part. You're gonna grab a hold of it and you're just gonna give it a shake. Make sure that that doesn't move because you want to shake it hard enough to the point where, you know, if you bumped into it, that it wouldn't drop. So move it side to side on those jack stands, see what happens, let it kind of level itself out, and you can double check them again, but everything seems pretty secure. And now that the mower is lifted and everything seems pretty secure, I have a little patio chair pad here. I lay that down on the ground. And all that does is it allows me to come up underneath the machine and just have a little better look at things. So the first thing I'm gonna to start to do down here is locate and remove my engine bolts. And you guys can see there's all kinds of oil up under here. This thing's been leaking for a while. Now this John Deere 325 has an electric PTO clutch. You can see it there. So that's what runs your mower deck. So when you click the button, there's a little electromagnet here 
and it just pulls this up and transfers your engine rotation to your deck belt so that your blades engage. Now, if you guys have melted PTO switches and you wanna see me uh, diagnose and replace one of these, you can check out the video in the top right of your screen now. But because the PTO clutch is bigger than the hole that they put in the frame, uh, we're gonna have to remove this PTO clutch. So we'll get to that once I loosen off the engine bolts. So looking at the machine from the front right bolt here, we can see that that just bolts into the engine. Now it might be a little hard to see, but we can see there is one of my engine bolts. And if we come over here to the other side, there is the other one. And once I remove these two engine bolts, then I can go ahead and move on to the ones at the back. Oh, and it was a half inch, so I'm just using a half inch deep socket with an extension. I'm gonna go up there and remove those two bolts. Okay, so I got my two front engine bolts out. Next up, I'm moving on to the rear engine bolts. It's gonna be a little bit harder because it, there are some idler pulleys and whatnot here. So I'm gonna relocate myself and we're gonna have a better look. So looking at the engine from the front, the back left engine bolt is easily accessible. So I came down here and I cracked it loose. So I'm just unthreading it by hand now using my extension. So that bolt is out now. Now they give you just enough room here to loosen off the nut that uh, is holding on those ground cables. So that is loose now. So I'm gonna get that nut off and then we're gonna go up underneath the machine and have a look at that idler pulley that's in the way. So using my jack and a two by four, I've relocated my jack stands to basically the front axle. So using the jack stands there, it's just gonna allow me to get a little better access in at the side here. And I didn't mention this before, but if you're ever lifting your machine up, you should always have some kind of wheel chalk so we use a little plastic one here and that kind of digs into the ground and that will prevent your machine from rolling back even though this has a hydrostatic and it most likely won't. Uh, wheel chalk will prevent any serious injury from occurring while you're underneath your machine. So I'm up under the right side of the machine and it's this idler pulley right here next to the PTO clutch. So if I come on an angle and I zoom in, you guys will be able to see that's our engine bolt right there. So that's an issue. So we have to relieve tension on the drive belt first of all. Now this belt, like my customer said, he wanted it replaced because looking at that side, it is looking like it's pretty rough condition. We have to understand that this drive belt here, it's always under tension. And this large spring right in front of you, that is our drive belt tensioner that goes back to a bracket that goes to an arm that goes to a pulley. So you disconnect this spring and it will put slack on our drive belt. Then we can go ahead and remove this nut, loosen off this pulley and it won't be under tension anymore. And if we come back to that pulley, looking at the drive belt, that is split. So in a matter of, I'm gonna assume weeks or months, that belt would have definitely snapped. And like I said, guys, he's got it in for repair, so we're doing everything. Now that spring's gonna be under a decent amount of tension. So what I'm gonna do here is I've put in a slotted screwdriver into the spring there, and I'm just gonna use that to pry it off. There we go. So if I give this a little tap, it should pop right up. Sweet. So now that we have that tensioner spring off, we can see that we have all kinds of slack on our belt here. So now I can go ahead and remove that pulley up top. Now, if we look underneath the back of the engine, that's where our ground cable is connected. We can see that that is in fact a carriage bolt. So John Deere's smart. So because they've put a carriage bolt there, that means that we can go ahead and remove that nut without that bolt spinning. The only thing is if you push up on it, it's gonna start to spin the bolt as well. So what you're gonna wanna do is just apply a downward pressure to it and that nut should come right off. And to get that pulley nut off, I'm just using my rigid impact with a 15 millimeter deep socket. So with the nut and that little idler bracket off, you can see that we can now move the pulley. I just have to loosen it off enough and push it off to the side. And just like that, our final engine bolt is out. Now I can move on to removing the PTO clutch and then I can go ahead and shift my engine back slightly and that will put even more slack on the dry belt pop the dry belt off and pull the engine off. Now, before I move on to the PTO clutch, there is going to be a couple little bushings on your idler pulley. So this round one here, that's just gonna go on the top. You're gonna put that just like that. Then you're gonna have your pulley and on the bottom of the pulley is gonna be a spacer here. And that spacer is just gonna go in like that. So you're gonna have this on the bottom side and you're gonna have that bushing right up on the top. So by taking that off now, you'll prevent it from falling out later and you know, possibly having one of those bushings flip up the wrong way because they do have a little groove. See if I can get a shot of it on the inside of the top of that bushing. And I'm assuming that's for the carriage bolt. 
because you have to remember they put a square slot in the carriage bolt. So, greasy job, but we're getting her done. Okay, so I ran my compressor and I'm right ready to take the bolt off of the PTO clutch here. But first, I have my light set up so you guys can see there's a wire because it is an electric PTO clutch. So you're gonna have to look for the connector and just simply unplug it from the wiring harness. And you should be able to track that back down along the frame. And I've found our little connector here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and unplug that and then we'll be ready to unbolt the PTO clutch. And then I have a 16 millimeter socket here that I'm gonna be using on my impact. Now this isn't an impact socket, this is a chromoly socket, but I can't find my 16 mil impact socket, so that's what I'm using. Now you may find that when you go to remove your bolt here, the PTO clutch, even though this part wiggles here, the clutch itself up top is gonna to be seized to the shaft. So what I have here is just a pneumatic air hammer, and what I'm gonna do is with the bolt just slightly loose there, I'm gonna go in and on the center of that bolt, I'm gonna hit it and it should give the PTO clutch enough vibration to kind of break it free from the crankshaft of the engine. And just like that, we should be able to undo our bolt here. Now that we've rattled it free using the impact and it should drop right down just like that. Now it appears we're just hung up on a little clip here, so I'm just gonna go ahead and pull that back a bit. And just like that, the PTO clutch has come off. I am gonna be cleaning this up because, like you guys can see here, it is just covered in oil. That crankshaft main seal on the engine has been leaking for a long time, and this PTO clutch is just soaked with oil. Now, you guys might find that your PTO clutch might not come off as easy, as sometimes these clutches can seize to the crankshaft. And that's because manufacturers, a lot of the time, don't use an anti-seize. And when I do go ahead and reinstall this PTO clutch onto the engine, I will be liberally applying Permatex nickel anti-seize to the inside of this PTO clutch and on the crankshaft itself on the engine. And that will prevent this from seizing onto the crankshaft. So the next time it has to come off either to replace the clutch or to replace a drive belt in the future, then it should slide off with no issue. Now the last step to engine removal is come around to the front and you can find your muffler nut right there. Now it might be difficult to see, but there's also another one right there. So there's two studs and the nuts go on to hold the muffler. So remove those nuts and then you should be able to slide the engine off without having to remove any of these little shroud pieces. So John Deere conveniently slotted this little muffler bracket here. So I'm using a 13 millimeter wrench to get that front nut off. And then you can see my ratchet in there to get the back one off and that should loosen things up. And then I can go ahead and loosen this off give it a little wiggle and it should pop out. And just from loosening them off, we can see that this is loose already. So that's another 13 mil right there. I'm gonna take that bolt out and then we should be able to lift the engine off. Now being ready to pull the engine means you have to have a place to put it because we have to remember that there's a crankshaft coming out of the bottom of that. So you can't just plop it on your workbench. So what I have here is a metal table. It's pretty strong. It's got some supports on the legs down below to keep things sturdy. I've leveled it off best I could just so that it doesn't rock because my floor is kind of uneven and there is a hole cut into it so the crankshaft can slide right through. So for now, this is where I'm gonna be dropping the engine. Now I do have a chain fall over there and I also have a little roller on an I-beam that comes across the center of my shop. If we look at this engine, you'll notice that it has two lifting points right here and also right at the back there. So I could lower this down, roll it back into the center of my shop, and then use my chain fall to lift up the engine. But this is a 17 horsepower engine, so it's light enough that I should be able to lift it up. The one thing I should note is the engine was catching on this little guy here. So all I did was I come over and just turned it simply just like that, and the engine was able to pull right up. So now I have the engine sitting here on my table, and it is now ready for disassembly. So that's it for part one of this video series, guys. I hope you did enjoy it. Like I said, I'm gonna be filming probably three or four parts on this so the next part is either going to be me removing and replacing the drive belt or me doing the engine gasket kit so stay tuned for those videos if you guys did enjoy the video think about leaving me a thumbs up you know it really helps me out you can click here to subscribe and click over here for one of my previous videos i upload every single week so be sure to stop on by next week check the channel out for new content and as always guys thanks for watching <laughs>